Hey, this is Nachliel Selavan, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Torah Intermedia. Before you go on to watch the video of this virtual Torah presentation or whatever it is, I just want to ask you to support this channel and to please click the red subscribe button on the bottom there. And if you can also click the notification, and that way, if you like this video, you'll be able to get notifications whenever I post a new video and I'm trying to post it more and more. If you like, even leave a comment. I'd really appreciate it. And now without further ado, let's enjoy the show. Our Torah for today is focused on the Persian Empire under in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And what I want to show you is actually some stuff from the Jewish world in Egypt and in Babylon from that time, which is surprising new stuff, really, really cool things, as well as to take you into the palace in Shushan Abira and to see some cool things in museums. And everything that I'm doing now is being recorded and it's going to be uploaded to my YouTube channel later. And it's called Torah Intermedia, Torah Intermedia. And you're gonna hear uh, more about it later, so you're going to be able to review it. So if you missed anything and you want to review it, you know, feel free to you know, su subscribe to the channel. You'll see more stuff and you'll be able to ask more questions as we go. If you want to know what's this, what was that, and where can I find out more? So let's get right into it. The first thing I want to do, and this is, this is the part that looks a little bit boring, but this is just so you understand what we're talking about. I want you to take a look just at the names that are in purple. Those names that are in purple are the kings that are in time in the time of Ezra Nehemiah and also Megillat Esther. And these are the ones we're going to be talking about. We're going to start with Koresh, which is Cyrus the Great. We're going to talk about uh, Artaxasta or Artaxerxes. Ignore Darius and Xerxes. I'm not getting into those right now. Xerxes is Achashverosh, but I'm not getting into that right now. Just so you know where it's happening. Because when we talk about Ezra Nehemiah, you need to remember that the Purim story already happened. This is after, because remember, it's Artach Shasta who helps us rebuild the walls of Yerushalayim after things were sort of left hanging, uh, which has happened earlier on. So that's kind of the background to our story. I'm going to return to this when we need to. I don't want you to get distracted by all this text. So let's get st straight into it. The book of Ezra and also the last words of the uh, have these words. This is the, the very famous Cyrus proclamation. Bishnat achat lekoresh melech paras lechlot varashem ipirumiyah. So Yirmiya was prophesying how, at a certain amount of time, after seventy years from a certain point, uh, we're going to be able to come back to Yehuda to, to, to build the Beit Hamikdash. And this is Koresh, the king of Persia. This is the new kingdom on the block. We had the, Bab the Babylonians, Babel. They fell down, and Cyrus the Great conquered the the. the Babylonian Empire. He's also ruling in Babel and Babylon as well. And he makes this proclamation where he says, Now, you're all very familiar with this. You've learned this. It's the first beginning of Ezra. And this is kind of the introduction to how things started in Yehuda. And then it took a long time until it finished. But that's the beginning story. Now, this picture on the bottom left, I'm going to actually take you to where it currently is sitting in London, in the British. You, you may be familiar about it. It's very famous. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. And the reason it's called that is because it was written by Cyrus, and it's the shape of a cylinder. Now, that's how we name things in archaeology. Now, I'm going to take you straight into it. I'm sharing my screen with you. Hang on. Hang on. Okay, what is going on? Okay, I just want to make sure, can you see the Cyrus cylinder in front of you? Just thumbs up. I want to make sure we're seeing the right screen. Okay, excellent. So this is the Cyrus cylinder. We're going to look around this room a little bit. The Cyrus cylinder, as you can see, is pretty small. You can hold it in two hands. It's very small, and it has about 45 lines written in cuneiform. And this is Cyrus the Great. Now, what exactly is so great about Cyrus? What is it that he did that made him so popular and so different than the Babylonian kings before him? So the Babylonian kings before him, the last one was uh, Nebunidus or Nebunaid. He, uh, he didn't allow the people of Babylon to worship the god of Babylon that they wanted, Marduk. He said, you have to worship a different god in this city. Now, that was a big deal because the people liked worshiping the gods that they're used to. They don't want people to tell them to worship somebody else, even though it's all of Odazara, but it's still, it's like they don't want somebody to tell them what to do. So Cyrus the Great came into Babylon and he said, I'm not like that guy, Nebuchadnezzar. That's what he writes here in the cylinder. I'm going to allow you to rebuild Babylon 
to build the temples of Marduk, Marduk, who's the, 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 the god of Babylon, and, uh, and I'm going to pay for it, and you can build it because I'm a great king. And then everyone goes, yay, he's so popular. They love Cyrus. Cyrus is the greatest. He's letting us do what we want. Now, Cyrus had this policy, which he allowed all of the people in the empire who were destroyed by Babel to go back and rebuild their temples for their gods, and the government is going to pay for it. Now, this is interesting because what he said for us, he also said for other countries, and that's what the Cyrus Cylinder tells us. It tells us the story of what Cyrus did for all these other countries, and we were one of them. He allowed us to build the Bet HaMikdash, but he didn't allow us to have a Melech. We did not have a king. And you'll know that the next time we have a king is with the Hashmonaim, because the Persians did not allow us to have a king. They didn't want us to get too powerful. So this is the Cyrus Cylinder. Now, before I show you another thing from Cyrus, which is really cool, I want to just take you a little bit around the British Museum so you see some stuff from the Persian Empire. So this guy over here, this, this uh, blue-looking guy, where did he run away? He ran away. Ah. This is a, a guardian. This is uh, colorful bricks. It, if you want to imagine Bigtan Vateresh, the two guardians of Achashverosh, what did they look like? We don't know what exactly they look like, but this is what they dressed like. This is a Persian or Madai, Median guard in the palace in Shushan. And we're gonna see the palace of Shushan a little bit later. But this is just showing you the guardians. They have curly black hair, dark skin. And if you go and see more pictures from their palace, there's all these pictures of different people from the palace coming and bringing gifts. See, they're holding gifts in their hands, coming and bringing gifts to the king. And here's the king with his crown and the sword, and he's walking, and everybody's behind him, bringing him stuff. So this is kind of the decorative stuff that they're going to have in their palace. Here's a, a chariot and horses. This is all from the Persian palaces. And there's also weapons. Here are swords and helmets. Uh, these are later Persian stuff. OK, so kind of cool. I'll show you a little bit of jewelry. And oh, we just walk. Here we are. These silver bowls are bowls from the palace of Achashverosh and Daryavesh and Artachshasta. All these kings had lots and lots of gold and silver bowls and drinking cups and jewelry. They were really, really rich and so rich that they would even sometimes throw the dishes out instead of washing them because it just wasn't worth it. There's just so much. Why wash the dishes made of gold and silver? You can just bring more. So they were very, very, very rich. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to another place. And hold on. It's when you share a few different screens, it can be a little bit, uh, okay. Here we go. So what I'm, gonna, gonna sh what I'm showing you now is the tomb of Cyrus the Great. We saw the Cyrus Cylinder, and I just want to show you his tomb because his tomb is a very powerful one. It's, it's a very important one. And even his enemy of the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great, paid respect to this tomb. This is the tomb of Cyrus the, Gate, the Great, which is currently in Iran, in Persia. Look. You can look around in the mountains of Iran. And here it is. And thousands of, and thousands of years, and the, the tomb of Cyrus the Great is still here, untouched, because he was such a powerful king that people respected him, and they, they didn't touch it. Just give you another angle on it. Here it is, the tomb of Cyrus the Great. Can you just imagine? almost 2,500 years, and it's still there. It's, it's really incredible that his tomb is still there. So this is the tomb of Cyrus the Great, okay? Now, from here, I'm going to, we're gonna go back to our story. Okay, so this is the Cyrus uh, Cylinder. Now, what I wanna share with you, uh, something really, really cool. I said I'm gonna mention something of Jews from the time. So this is a map of the ancient Near East, and you can see on the bottom left is Yam HaMelach. You can see the Dead Sea, you see Yerushalayim, right? It's all there. And on the right-hand side, you have Bavel. And you can also see on the very far right, Paras, Persia, and Shushan, or as it's called today, Shush. They just add the Nun at the end, but it's Shush. So Shushan Abiraz over there. Now Shushan, Cyrus the Great conquers the, the Babylonian Empire, and he also rules in Bavel. And you can see where Bavel is. If you look carefully right over here, this is Babylon, this is Babel. Now in this orange highlighted area, not too long ago, 
we found a lot of clay documents written just like the Cyrus cylinder in cuneiform, in this reed that you poke into clay and then you bake the clay, right? In Aramaic, we found documents from several generations of Jews who arrived there right after the destruction of the first Bet HaMikdash until the time of Koresh and later. And I wanna show you some of these documents because they relate to our time and our story in different parts of the world. So this is what they look like. This is one of uh, many of them that we found. And I wanna take you to uh, one exhibit that talks about these museums, the, these, these documents. It's, they're called the Al Yahudu documents. And why are they called Al Yahudu? What does Al Yahudu sound like? Or El Yahudu? It sounds like Yehudim. And because when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Bet HaMikdash and he took the Yehudim from Yehuda, from Judea, and he took us to Babel, he put us all in one place, which he called the Jewish place, Al Yahudu, the place of the Jews. So what I'd like to take you now really briefly is into an exhibition by the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem. You should all be able to see it in front of you. Just thumbs up if you see it. All blue in there. Okay, excellent. So you see it. You see it says on the top, Al Yahudu. Al Yehudu, Jerusalem and Babylonia. So we found these documents and it's really cool that we found them. And I just wanted to show you a few of them so you get the idea and why I'm showing these to you. Because after the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, we were in Babel and we were going to give up. It was so sad. Everything was destroyed. We were taken away from our home, from our family. And the Navi Irmiyahu tells us, don't, worry, don't, don't be too sad. I want you to rebuild your community and, and, and get married and have children and build houses and and build up yourself so you become successful. And this, these documents show that we did that and we were successful and we did business in Babylon. So you can read these, they're in Aramaic and you can read all these Jewish names in here and it's really, really cool to be able to see that. But I really want to take your, your attention here, that's that, that's that map. I really want to just show you one area right over here, you see these documents? Where you can see an entire family of Jews so what, the, what were the names of these Jews between this destruction of the Beit HaMikdash to the beginning of Sefer Ezra and Echemiah? So we have Smachyahu, Yapayahu, Rafa'ayahu, Achikam. Some of these names you've heard before. Some of these names are kind of like Rafael, but it's Rafa'ayahu, it's a little bit different. But you have Neriyahu and Chagai and Yehoezer. And these are all Jews who are doing business in Babel. So it's really cool. You kind of get to see like a postcard from the past. Like here's Jews and here on the right is all these names of these various different Jews. So it's really, really cool. Now, what I'd like to show you now is just one of them, of these documents. Um, here's one that mentions Al Yahudu, mentions the Jewish place. And here's another document. Again, it's written in Aramaic, but it's Jews. One of these documents is talking about, and that's the text on the bottom, it's Shesh Shekel Kesef Kov. There's a debt of six shekels of silver that he's being paid. And when you write a document, you always write a date. Now, how do we date things today? Well, today we have the Jewish year and we have the civil year, which is based on a Christian event, which is not really important to Jews. That's the birth of, of Jesus, right? That's really what the year 2000 is. And so the real important date for us Jews is actually Tafshin Pei, 5780, right? Which has to do with the creation of the world. That's the date that we count. But the rest of the world, how do you count before all of this? you would write the year of the king. And so this is Shnat Chamesh Koresh Melech Bavel Ve'aratzot. Year five to Koresh the king of Bavel in all of the lands. So Koresh is the king of Babylon because he conquered the Persian, the British, the Babylonian empire. So that is really, uh, really cool. So fine, that was one thing that we saw. Now I'm taking you to the next guy. Now we have Ezra and Nehemiah. So the next king we're talking about is Artachshasta or Artaxerxes. Now, Take a, look, uh, take a look at these two places. These are both from the stuff you're learning about, Ezra and Nehemiah. And I highlighted Ezra and I highlighted Nehemiah and Shushan Habira and Artach Shasta. Okay? Now, the, notice that Book of Ezra and also many parts of uh, Nehemiah are written in Aramaic. Okay? Why are they written in Aramaic? I mean, uh, Book of Daniel. Because the Jews at the time spoke. Aramaic, they're in Bavel, that's the language. And those documents we saw are also in Aramaic because this is the reality. It's so cool that you get through archaeology to see the conversation of Jews who are in Bavel and they are speaking Aramaic because that's what Jews spoke. So here we have Artachshasta Melech Malchaya Leezra Kahana Safardata. So Artachshasta, the king of kings, is sending a message to Ezra, who is the Kohen, who is the scribe, 
etc., etc. And he's saying, I'm going to allow you to take things to Yerushalayim and do this and this and that. Okay? Now, I want us to focus on Al-Takhshasta so you can remember him when you think about him and know who came first. Al-Takhshasta, al Tachshasta, Koresh. To remember these things. To remember Koresh was first. Now we're much later with al Tachshasta. Okay? Now, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah is also uh, in Shushan Habira. He's not in, he, he's in Shushan, but he's in the palace with our Shasta. And so here we have stories, the Chodesh Kislev, Chodesh Nisan. Now you notice that this is the Babylonian months, Kislev and Nisan. That's the months that we got from Babel. The months that we use today, Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev, those are Babylonian months, which we brought back to us when we came from Babel. In the Torah, it's HaChodesh HaRishon, HaChodesh HaSheni, right? So, what I want to point out, first of all, who is Artach Shasta? So here's an image of Artach Shasta from the tomb, also uh, next to Cyrus's tomb. It's actually just a few minutes away from there, where there's his tomb as well. They have several different Persian kings who are buried in the mountain. They're very high up. And this is an image of Artach Shasta, or Artach Shash the first. Now hang in there because there's going to be a little surprise about Artach Shasta from Egypt, which has to do with the Jews. Hopefully we'll get there, we'll get there soon, okay? So this is Artach Shasta. I just wanted to mention him. And before we go into, um, before we go into uh, the, the, the uh, Shushan Habira, I just want to mention that my family has a tradition that we come from Nehemiah. And that's why my family in America have a lot of, of, of Nehemias in the family. Because we have, in fact, in Europe, they call us the Nehemiahs. Because we everyone was named Nehemiah, named after Nehemiah. So that's a tradition that we have. Now, just so we remember who's who, just one more time. Here's our, here's our timeline. Cyrus the Great, Kovish is, is in the beginning. Ignore all the ones in black. It's not important for us. Dar Yavesh, we know about Dar Yavesh from Tanakh. And Churchersh, Xerxes is Achshayarsha, is Achashverosh. And then we have his son, Artach Shasta. Okay? So that's, that's our story. So we've, we've started with Koresh. Now we're holding in Artach Shasta. And now let's take a look. Shushan Habira. What does the word Bira mean? Feel free to, to type up in the, in the chat. What does the word bira mean? This is a picture, a reconstruction of the palace that we're about to visit. Okay, bira means capital. Okay, excellent. I wanted to hear that from everybody because I want to now show you how that's actually a modern word for, for the capital. It actually meant something different. So this is going to be, this is the fun part. So let's go into Shushan Habira. Okay, going to Shushan, and here we are. So if you look carefully in the center of the map, it says Susa or Shush, which is what it's called uh, today. We just add the Nun Sofit Shushan, just to, it's a pronunciation thing. So in Shushan, about 100 years ago, there were excavations where we actually uncovered the palace of Achashverosh. Here in Shushan Habira, it wasn't only a Hashverosh, it was all of the Persian kings. Now look here where it says Shosh, Shush, that's Shushan Habira. Okay, Apadna Castle Shush. Let's go and click on that and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to take my Google Earth guy and go straight there. Cool. Okay, this is what remains of it. The walls are all taken down. But you can see the bases of lots of different walls. I'm gonna take you to a few more pictures so you can get a better glimpse, a better idea of what's going on here. Okay. Ha, ah. okay. Hang in there. So we're seeing different parts of the palace. It's a little bit hard to see it from the floor because it's all been destroyed by the by the Greeks later on, but I want to show you is to understand what Bira means. So let's zoom in a little bit further. So here's the palace, okay? Everything that you see here is on the hilltop, and this is the actual palace of Achashverosh and the Persian kings. This courtyard here called the Apad Apadana, which is also mentioned in Sefer Daniel, Apadano, right, is kind of like a courtyard, a reception hall, which has 36 pillars, and it, the pillars were very, very tall. So we're going to get back to that picture where we saw an artist reconstructing what this palace looked like. But this palace is almost half a mile wide. This is very, very big. And this is because the Persian kings had to host so many people. You think about how long the, the, the Purim, the, not Purim, 
the festival in the Megillah was in Shushana Bira was 180 days. That's half a year. I mean, you have to have a massive place to hold all these people. So this is the palace. And here we have a garden outside. It's kind of later, but so when you read about Achashverosh going outside to Ginat Bitana Melech, right, there's a garden, there's gardens here. But here's the interesting thing. There's Shushan Habira and there's the Ir Shushan. What's the difference between Shushan Habira and Ha'ir Shushan? And as we mentioned in the Megillah, even though we're not doing Esther right now, we did that last year. So look at all of this. All of this at the bottom of the hill is part of the ancient city of Shushan. See, Susa, Shush. This is the ancient houses. They're not, they didn't last anymore, and this is modern. But this is the palace. The palace is at the top of a, of a hill. It's a fortress, where at the bottom is the city. What does Shushan Habira mean? Shushan Habira, Bira means fortress. It means the castle on the top of the hill. And then you have the regular house. The Bira is always something that's on the top there, that's powerful. And the city, Ha'ir Shushan is around it at the bottom. And in ancient cities, in the time of the, of the Tanakh, this is how cities always were. The palace the, was always at the top of the city. Like we have at the top of Ir, Ir David, we have the Beta Mikdash in the palace of Shlomo Melech, or at the top of Lachish, or Azikah, or Chatzol. All those ancient cities have a palace on the top with a, with a wall. And at the bottom is the rest of the city with the fields. That's Ha'ir Shushan. This is Shushan Habira. So I thought that would, that would be cool to show you that. Now, really briefly, I want to show you one more palace, which has been preserved in a much, much better state. But it's very, very similar to that palace. Uh, it's just a little bit further south. And that's the palace in Persepolis. Now, uh, I, this is way, way, way further down south. Look, if I'm going to zoom out just so you get the idea. This is Persepolis. And Shushan is over here. This is Persepolis. Okay, but it's the, same, it's the same model of the palace because when the architects made it, they said, hey, this is so great, let's make another one. But this one is so much better because it was preserved, even though it was destroyed by Alexander the Great, but it still remains, a lot of it, and you can actually go and see it with Google Earth and Street View. So I want to take you into the, another palace of Achashverosh and Achashasta and all these kings, just so you get a sense of how tall and imposing uh, and, and magnificent the palace was. So you're walking into the palace. There's servants here. The color, of course, faded. Here's the king sitting on his throne at the very top of this massive gate. And let's walk in a little bit, just a little bit, just so you get a little bit of a taste and kind of imagine these pillars being much, much higher. There's a few of them that are still several stories high, holding up a magnificent ceiling. And you're coming to the palace of the Persian king of, of, our, of our Tachshasta or Achashverosh or Koresh. Look at this massive palace just looking around a little bit, even though it's been destroyed. Isn't that amazing? Broken pillars on the floor fell apart, was conquered. And this is called Persepolis, which is Greek for the Persian city, Paraspolis, Persepolis. These tall pillars. Look at the height of that thing. Imagine standing right here. This is the height of a person, right here. And you're looking at that amazing, imagine a ceiling on top of that. This is a fascinating, fascinating palace. And there's a, a bullhead. They had lions and bulls and all kinds of really, really cool stuff. There's far away, this is very, very far away. This is, a, this is a very, very big palace. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And we can really just go on and on. I just wanted you to get a flavor of the massive palaces of the Persian kings. Really, really cool. Okay. So this is uh, the Persian Empire, right? So we've seen what Bira means, Shushana Bira. We've seen stuff that relate to our Tachshasta. We've seen the king. We've seen that the word Bira means fortress, actually. And I think that on that note, we can move on to see um, our last thing. And then we're going to have time for some, uh, for some questions. So let me go back to our slide. So this is the reconstruction of the palace in color. Now, everything that you've seen is just the very bottom of it. Now you have to imagine all of this. You see the pillars, the, the roofs, and then the open parks with courtyards and gardens. Really fascinating, okay? Now I wanna show you one more thing, which has to do with the Jews from this time, from our Tachshasta, and something which when I saw it for the first time, I was, I was breathtaking. It was amazing for me to, when I actually was able to read what I saw, and I saw this in real life, 
it, it, it completely amazed me. And if you wouldn't have this introduction and you'd see it, you'd go like, eh, whatever, I don't know what that is. So I wanna show you something which at first is gonna be a little bit difficult to see, but I'm gonna challenge you and I'm gonna give you some, some tools to look at it and then you're gonna suddenly see what this is. And I hope you'll also be amazed by it. So our next story has to do with the Jews who are living in, in Elephantine, which is at the very, very south of Egypt. And I'm gonna show you the place in just a moment. So a papyri is plural for papyrus. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of the word papyrus because that's where the word paper comes from. The Egyptians invaded a, invented a kind of papyrus, which is a paper which is made from reeds, which you kind of put, uh, put this reed inside of some kind of solvent and it becomes soft, it's kind of, it's a leaf. To read, and then you can dry it out and write on it with ink. That's papyrus. Now, there was a Jewish community living in, 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 in an island called Yeb. The Greeks called it Elephantine because they traded with elephant tusks, with ivory there. And uh, they were probably there from the time of Yeshiao. They've been there for at least 100 years earlier, and they continued into the Persian period. Now, these letters were written by the Jewish community in Elephantine, in Yeb, to the Kohanim in the Beit HaMikdash in the time of the Persian period, of Artach Shasta and all these kings. And they were in communication with, with, the, with the Jewish community, asking them questions and so on, and how to celebrate Pesach and different kinds of things, because they've been far away for hundreds of years. It's like they said, we want to stay Jewish. We want to be connected, but we're so far away. So, and they also had contracts. And of course, it's all in Aramaic, because it's just like the Jews in Babel. They're under the Persian Empire. They speak Aramaic. So it's really, really cool. Now, this is one of them. This is the one which is in the Brooklyn Museum. There's one of them in the Brooklyn Museum on display, but they have more of them in storage. And I saw them on exhibit. Now I'm gonna show you that you can actually read this papyrus and read what it is, okay? Now I can take you to the island of Elephantine. I think it would be cool. But before we do that, I wanna take you into reading it, okay? So um, here is the text. I just highlighted the top part. Now. You can cheat by looking at the bottom, but here's the cool thing. Um, it's written in Hebrew that's a little bit hard to read. It really took me a long time to figure this out and I found the books to read about it. But look, when you're looking at the top, I'm gonna read the bottom, but I want you to look at the top and try to see if you can follow along and understand what he's saying. Because you've been learning Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, Aramaic, this is easy for you, okay? So here it says, Yerach Tchot, Shnat Arba, Artachshash Malka Aden Beson Birata. Now that was a lot, okay? But it's kind of cool. First of all, what does Yerach mean? What is Yerach? Here we can, uh, let's hear, have the chat. Okay. Month, very good, month. And I see somebody, I, I missed a few questions here. Let me just see, but okay. How did they build it? Oh, wow, how did they build these things? That's you know what? They had incredible builders back then. So Yerach means month. Now remember that we're counting in different systems of counting. When you go and look up like Indiana Jones and you're looking at the past, you have to already know that the way people wrote is not the same. They're not going to write 1995, right? They're going to, it's a different dating system. So Yerach Tchot means the month of Tchot. What is Tchot? It's in, in English, we call it Thoth, but it's really Tchot, which is this Egyptian God, the Ibis, the God of wisdom and scribe and the scribe, this is Thoth. So they had different months of different Egyptian gods. This is the month of Thoth, the month of Thoth, the year four to Artach Shasta Malka Aden, the king, Beson Birata. What is Son Birata? Well, what does Birata mean? This is an Aramaic, very similar to the Hebrew. What does Birata mean? Can you guess? Very good, capital and fortress, perfect. Son birata. So this is a document. I'm not gonna go into the boring parts about it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a business document. I'm gonna give you this amount of this, you give me this amount of that kind of grain and food. It's not so interesting. It's interesting because of the name. You're reading a Jewish document, there's Jewish names signed on it, okay? And, and, um, and it says, this is the fourth month of so-and-so. In the fourth year of Artach Shasta, the king, so he's the king in Persia, but we're here and we are signing this document in the fortress of Son or Sien, which is right next to Elephantine. It's right there, I'm gonna show it to you on the map. So very good. In this case, Son is not a capital, it's not. It's just a fortress, that's all it is. It's a bira, and the word Shushana bira and Son birata come from the same period of time. So when you say bira, 
it means fortress or citadel and not capital, even though some of the fortified uh, cities, some of the, cap the citadels were capitals, but that's not what it necessarily means. So that's, and here the name is Amar, Anani Bar Chagai Bar Meshulam. So you know the name Anani, it's like Anane, an something like that, Anani, Bar Chagai Bar Meshulam. Isn't that cool? When you look at the text and you suddenly go like, this is our Tachshasta, the guy I read about from Israel Nechemia. Oh my gosh, that's what happened to me when I read this. And I also saw like in the 11th month of Adar to, our, to Achashverosh, I mean, I just saw these things and I was like, oh my gosh, it's just incredible to see this. So we're almost done. I want to show you, I just want to take you to, um, where's Elephantine? I had Elephantine ready, wait just a moment. Um, okay. I want to take you just to Elephantine and to show you what we're talking about. So I'm going to go like this, Elephant, Elephantine, Elephantine Island Pyramid. Here we go. Boom. Now just to realize, when you're saying Elephantine, here it is, okay? Jews were in Elephantine for hundreds of years before the story of Purim. And we were having a Jewish community there. Just imagine where, how far away we are, just so you get an idea. Look, we still didn't get to the, to the top of the Nile. You understand, here's Israel. There's Jews here in Babel, right? And, and here's Shushan. And all the way down here, there's a Jewish community. This is before internet, before telephones, before public transportation, before airplanes. It's a far away place. It's in the middle of nowhere, but right? it's, it's incredible how far away it is. So I just want you to, to appreciate how far away that is. And I just want to show you. So here's the island of Elephantine. There's a pyramid here. There's all the regular Egyptian stuff. There's a temple of Khnum. Over here on the side, now it says post office Aswan Central. Aswan is Son, Son Birata. There's a fortress in Son. Here's Aswan Elementary Court, Aswan this, Aswan that. This is called Aswan, okay? But that comes from Son, and that's Son Birata. So there's the Jews here in Elephantine. We're writing a document somewhere in a fortress here, and they're just saying, we are here in this place, and we have a deem, we have a testament, we have witnesses, and this is just a Jewish document from the Jews who are living here. So I'm going to summarize here, and then we're going we're gonna to have time for questions, but just to appreciate how far away Jews were in different parts of the world, and we were speaking Aramaic, and we were relating to these kings, and through archaeology, we get to see missing parts of the story that you already know, and suddenly, like, oh my gosh, what's happening with the regular people in the time of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Korish? What's going on in the Jewish world, in Babel, in Shushan, in Egypt? It's really cool to see this, and I hope that I've at least given you a little more curiosity to look at more and more into these things and it's been a tremendous opportunity to be able to see different parts around the world so i'm going to stop the share now and you can also unmute yourselves if you have any questions please i would be happy to answer i'm going to try to see if there's questions i didn't answer in the chat okay yeah thanks for telling me you didn't see the map that would be a little embarrassing um okay how did, Benny Marmer asked me, how did they build it? How did they build what? Uh, the palace, I'm guessing? Thank you, Chaim. Thank you, everyone. The palace. The, I mean, the pyramids are much more impressive than that, and they managed to do that over 2,000 years earlier. So they had amazing builders, and it was a massive empire. They were very, very rich, so they were able to pay for it. Right? You're very welcome. Thank you, Ariella, Sivan, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moshe. And I'm reminding you all, this is going to be um, on my YouTube channel, Torah Intermedia. Dovi's going to post more about it, so you're going to get to see. You can always, I hope you subscribe so you get to see other virtual tours I did and more tours that are coming up. There's lots of fun stuff. Now, how did the Jews get to Elephantine? So the best guess that we have is in the time of King Yoshiyahu HaMelech, there were, there were um, uh, in the time of Yoshiyahu, or um, actually in the time of Menashe, the son of of Chizkiyahu HaMelech, he had to send troops and soldiers to be part of the Assyrian Empire. That was part of the deal um, after uh, Sanherib almost destroyed Jerusalem and then his son as well, uh, Esau Chadon. The Assyrian kings kept control of Yehuda. And so part of the deal when you're subjugated to the Assyrian Empire is you have to send troops to their army. And we have actually records in the Assyrian documents of Menashe and kings of Yehuda who have sent X number of soldiers and chariots into their campaigns into Egypt. 
And so there were, must have been Jewish soldiers stationed far south in Egypt, which was controlled by Assyria, and then controlled by Egypt, and by Babylon, and then by Persia. So the Jews were just there. And they were actually, at that time, 200 years later, 100 years later, they were soldiers in the Persian Empire. It was, it was Jewish soldiers in the Persian Empire working for the Persian king. So they were already there for 100 and something years. The Jews of Elephantine is a really amazing story. I hope you, you even remember the name Elephantine. It's just such a great name. Okay. Uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, I hope you have the rest, a gra great rest of the day and tests and activities and all that stuff. Thank you for sticking along so much. It's been a real pleasure. All right.